Welcome back to The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli. We're on chapter six. So exciting. It's a good book. Okay. When Robin woke next morning, John Go with the Wind had a good fire going. Even though rain fell at intervals and the wind was still blowing, he was grilling slices of bacon over the fire. And standing beside him was Brother Luke holding a large loaf from which he was cutting huge slices of bread. He heard Robin stirring and greeted him with his blessing. I hope thy log house kept thee dry, he said. John, John, has, been in, John has been inquiring of the shepherd yonder about the white swan. He says we are beyond it and it is over on the other hand. I'm sorry, the other road. <laughs> I should have remembered, said John but it is long since I came this way. We truly took the wrong turning. Let it be a lesson for us, said the good friar. We mind how the two roads were one where we stopped at the Eleanor Cross, yet so swiftly did the two forks divide that now we're several miles from the one we should have taken. So it goeth. God grant we may never be worse off than now, when we take the wrong turning. Okay. Not far beyond the place where they had camped, a path led through the road. There they were somewhat sheltered from the wind and rain. The shepherd had said to follow the path to a certain stream at the far side of the wood, which would shortly lead them to the high road. They found it without difficulty. John go with the wind, John go in the wind, sang so heartily and made such music with the harp that the way seemed short. When they reached the stream, Brother Luke said, "'Tis best for thee to go into the water as always. So off with thy clothes, Master Robin." But it is cold and flesh creeps at the thought of it, said Robin, shivering. <laughs> Come, my son, doth the father stop it? Doth thy father stop to say, I cannot go into battle for my king because arrows are sharp? Off with thy clothes, I say, else thou lose the strength and skill thou hast begun to have. Tis a long way from freezing. While he spoke, he lifted Robin down and helped him to undress and go into the, the river. At first, Robin's teeth chattered, but in a few moments, he was warmer and glad he had made the effort. At noon, the little company stopped at the sign of the shepherd's bush for ale to go their bread and cheese. Forgive me, let me reread that. At noon, the little company stopped at the sign of the shepherd's bush for ale to go with their, for ale to go with their bread and cheese. <laughs> the host set himself down beside the friar and asked how things went in London. Travelers from London be few since the plague, he said. Think it, thinkest thou the plague is over? Tis quiet at least, answered Brother Luke, and we believe tis gone. And how goes the war? Be they going well? Hast heard how tis with my lord the king? It goes hardly, but it goes our way, said Robin importantly. I have had a letter saying that the king hopes for a peace by the feast of Christmas. Peace, said the host wonderingly. Peace is what we all hope for, but we find it seldom. For it tis not the Welsh, tis the Scots. If tis neither one nor the other, then tis neither, then tis neighbor against neighbor, or tis the lord of the manor against the peasants, begging thy pardon, young master. They set out again and made good speed, reaching the village of Heathcote by dust. There they found an inn at the edge of town, its thatched 
its thatch pulled down over its eyes of windows, wherein could be seen a smoky light from the fire. A creaking sign showed the picture of the white heart. <laughs> An innocent name, said the friar, but this place hath a fearsome look. John Go in the Wind held horse and jennet while the friar went in to acquire about lodging for themselves and their tired beasts. When he came out, he said, I have a doubt whether this be a good place to stay. There are ill-seeming ruffians sitting about the fire, and the good wife hath a, a slatter, slatternly look. But we have no choice. Come then. He helped Robin to the ground and got him to the fire, for he was cold and stiff from the long day in the saddle. John took the horse and Janet to the stable, a tumble-down affair at the back. It was fortunate there was food in the saddlebags, for the white heart had none to offer. Leather noggins of ale were all that could be had, and when Brother Luke paid for it and for the room, Robin saw the two strangers fasten their look on the money pouch Brother Luke carried for their journey. He wished they could have slept out, out of doors as they had done the night before, but he was chilled and the fire felt good, even though it smoked and made his eyes smart. As soon as they had eaten the bread and cheese, Brother Luke helped Robin up the narrow stair and put him to bed on the straw pallet. Brother Luke fell asleep as soon as he lay down. John was soon snoring too. Robin could hear the wood in the door vibrate with the sound, for John lay just outside the room to guard it. Robin was so tired, he felt as if every bone pushed through the straw to find the unyielding boards beneath him. He slept and woke, slept and woke, till it seemed as if it should be morning. The two evil-looking men still muttered below over their ale, getting louder as it grew later. At first, Robin noticed Robin didn't notice what they were saying. Then something like the minstrel's left, the minstrel's hefty look caught his ear, so he held his breath to listen, then heard one of them say, Come midnight, when it's, when tis darkest, I shall take yon minstrel, and thou, the friar, be sure to get the leather bag safe. The child will be nothing for he cannot move fast, and he will sleep sound. He was like to die of weariness while he ate. Hark, the big one snores like a braying jack. They were planning to steal the money pouch. What should he do? He must do something and do it quickly. How could he wake the weary friar without noise? Or how warn John go in the wind without opening the door? Which should he do first? Perhaps it would be better if he woke the friar first. Softly, softly, Robin slid off the pallet, trying not to rustle the straw. He hitched himself along the floor, but the sound of his moving over the boards alarmed the two who were talking below. Hist! Should the big one for Robin knew it was he, what is that? They were still for a moment. So was Robin. Tis not, answered the other scornfully. Thou'rt easily frightened for so great a bully. Tis but a scurrying rat. Tis nigh the mid of night, he went on, for I heard a cock crowing. Shall we start then? Wait, said the first voice. Because they're, they're, they are city folk, the cock's crow might wake them. So wait a little. Robin dared not move. 
Yet there was no time to lose. He reached out his hand, but it fell short of touching the friar's frock by almost a foot. He lifted himself as high as he could on his hands, moved one, bearing his weight, slid both legs after slowly, slowly, then moved the other hand and slid forward again. It did make some sound, but when he listened, he heard only the sputter of the fire and a hound's far off barking. Perhaps the ale had silenced the louts. He touched the friar's shoulder. Brother Luke, used to waking at midnight for matins, set up immediately, saw the blur of white that was Robin's face, but said nothing, only looked steadily into Robin's eyes until his own grew used to the dark. Robin whispered in his ear, Robbers, he said, thieves, pointing downward. Brother Luke nodded, held his fingers to his lips, and rose to his feet without a sound. He crept to the door, keeping close to the wall, so as not to tread on a squeaky board. He lifted the latch slowly and opened the door inch by inch, so that John, who lay against it, rolled into the room, still snoring. <laughs> Brother Luke took firm hold of John's shoulder and at the same time touched his mouth with a finger to warn him not to speak. John was awake in the middle of a snore, but he too was used to being wakened suddenly and was well acquainted with danger. So, knowing that he always snored in his sleep, he began to snore again, nodding his head the while to show that he knew what was afoot. He gave one great snore, sighed heavily, then moaned as if he had been dreaming and had turned over. He used that time to get soundlessly to his feet. Luckily, he had brought cloaks and other gear in the saddlebags. His own cloak, which was travel-worn and patched, he presently tied to a corner, tied by a corner to an iron-bound chest which stood under the window. He motioned for Brother Luke to go down first, showing by gestures how he would hand down the bags, Robin's crutches, and lastly, Robin. Then he followed, then he would follow. He was not far to the ground, for the inn was only a cottage. Would Robin be able to hold his weight by his arms? He could only try. It was a tight squeeze for the friar to go through the small window, but he got through, and by way of the cloak down to the ground, he grunted when the saddlebags landed against his stomach, but was ready to reach up for the crutches. When John pulled the cloak, when John leaned out to hand them down. Then came Robin. John pulled the cloak in and wrapped it partly around Robin so that he could get out of the window without falling and held him under the arms until he could get hold of, his clo of the cloak. Robin was able to let himself down slowly, hand over hand, to land safely beside the waiting friar. Suddenly, great scuffling and shouting began. John scrambled out the window and slid to the ground. Then Robin heard the big fellow say, By my beard, the birds have flown! The night hag take thee! <laughs> shouted the other. We stayed too long over the ale! Run! shouted John, catching up with the, catching up the saddlebags, while the friar hosted Robin to the back, giving him the crutches to hold. They ran, but already the thieves were sliding down the cloak, and at their heels, Robin turned and with one hand thrusted the crutch between the big fellow's feet, throwing him to the ground and bringing the other ruffian down on top of him. Haste! urged Robin. They are so befuddled that each is pounding the other, thinking it is us that they've caught. 
They got up, they got to the stables, mounted the horses, and were away before the two oofs had untangled themselves. Brother Luke took Robin with him on Baynard, and John, go in the wind, carried the saddlebags, rolled on Jenny. Rode on Jenny. <laughs> Not until they were well through the village and out into the open country did they stop to rest and consider what they should do. There, they off the high road. There, just off the high road, stood a great barn. The door was secured by a padlock, but John Go in the Wind managed to get it through the granary window. Get in through the granary window. He opened one of the smaller doors to the weary travelers, and there they finished the short night. Before leaving in the morning, early morning, the friar said, We must leave a farthing for our host, whoever he may be, and our blessing. So saying, he said the morning office before they set out again. That is the end of chapter 6 of The Door in the Wall. I'll see you next time.